Um, thank you to those who are uh, giving online so generously. Uh, we, uh, we are a family, so even in tough times, we, we go through these times together, and I'm just so grateful to be a part of this body, uh, to be able to worship with you today, and uh, God has a message for us. God has a message for us. Uh, for those who are tuning in uh, on the live stream, again, I want to welcome you. I believe that the Lord will continue to bless us in, in these times as we continue to unite our hearts in worship to him, that we would not uh, be so distracted by the ways of the world, uh, but we would focus on Jesus, on his cross, on his sacrifice for us. Um, let's turn to the word of God today. Uh, let's turn to Revelation chapter 3. Verse 14 to 22 is our text, and I would like all of us to find it in your Bibles, please. Even if you're at home, please turn. Um, I want you to be uh, monitoring if I'm reading from the Bible or not, uh, because if I read from something else, you need to come and say, Pastor, that's not right. Uh, so I want you to be monitoring. So please find Revelation 3, 14 to 22. And if you have found it, Please comment Christ-likeness. Please say Christ-likeness. All right, all right, Christ-likeness. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father God, I come before you humbly, asking you to bless the preaching of your word. Holy Spirit, do your ministry in me and in us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week, we established that there are two kinds of faith. Uh, one is a me-based faith, and the other is a God-based faith. A me-based faith is all about me. What can God do for me? A me-based faith is kind of like treating God like Santa Claus. How many of you are living with Santa Claus today? In the month of April, the fifth day in 2020. No one is living with Santa Claus because Santa Claus is only welcome on Christmas Day. But then you ask him to leave because he's not welcome. You only like Santa Claus for the gifts he brings you, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, and then maybe you give him a cookie and a warm cup of milk, and then you say, off you go. Go back to wherever you came from. That's a me-based faith mentality. What can God do for me? because it's all about me. On the other hand, there is another kind of faith which we recognized last Sunday as a God-based faith, which is all about glorifying God, lifting Him up. It's your will, not mine. Even if your will doesn't look like my plans, it's okay, you are perfect. Everyone say to your neighbor once again, God is perfectly perfect. God is perfectly perfect. And so we are moving from a me-based faith to a God-based faith. If you are moving from a me-based faith to a God-based faith, please say Christ-likeness. 
Type down Christ-likeness. It's okay if you make a typo. It's pretty long, I know. But Christ-likeness, Christ-likeness. We are becoming more like Jesus every day. And so we come again to the passage we've been studying. And this is our second week. And by the way, uh, seven churches of Revelation. Today is part 16, which concludes our series. And today's sermon is entitled this. If I could sum up this sermon series, it is this. I love you. And the I is not me. <laughs> it's God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit saying to us, I love you, son. I love you, daughter. I love you. I've been reading through Revelation, and it's been so revealing to me, and God has been speaking to me with, with the text. And I'm going to read for you from Revelation 6, verse 9 to 11. It's talking about God-based faith Christians. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. Me-based Christians don't, me-based faith Christians don't understand this text very well. They're like, what do you mean? Christians get killed? I don't want any of that. I don't want any suffering or pain. But God-based faith Christians will understand this text very well, that the foundation of the church of Jesus Christ has been built upon the blood of the martyrs, including the ultimate martyr, who is our Lord Jesus Christ. God-based faith Christians have already given up their lives on the altar and have no fear of martyrdom. It's not like they're looking to die somewhere. It's just they are anchored in the faith so securely that even when persecution comes our way, we will not be swayed. We will not detract to the left or to the right, but we will be focused on Jesus. Let me introduce you to ladies of faith that came to my country, South Korea. As, as many of you know, I, I am from South Korea. I was born there, and I was raised in the UK, and then I did my rest of my school uh, work in, in Korea, and then I, I came to the United States to do graduate studies. And um, I've told you many a times that God has called me and my family to be missionaries in America. But the truth of the matter is that missionaries from America came to us about 100 years ago. Many of them. Many of them came, uh, they left a lot of comfort that was in the States. They left a, 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 a road that was so, uh, I, I guess, they were on the road to success, as it were. They were professionals. They were well-educated. Came from maybe nice families, too, some of them. But I want to introduce to you two ladies of the faith that came to my country. Uh, the first lady I want to introduce is... Uh, Dr. Rosetta Sherwood Hall. She was a, a Methodist uh, missionary to South Korea, and, and she uh, it was a medical professional, of course. And when she was single, she came to the land of Chosun. That's what it was called back then, Korea. And she met her husband. Uh, and her husband, William, uh, William James Hall, uh, was from Canada. And both of them, um, they got married, and, and they had two children. But the husband, Pastor Robert, uh, Pastor Williams, excuse me, uh, he was serving the people of Korea so much as a, as a medical doctor that he contracted a virus. And in the end, he died from that virus. So Rosetta was left a widow with two kids. And after a while, her daughter contracted a virus in Korea and they had no antidote. So the daughter also died. 
And Rosetta, do you think she went home and said, you know, I've had enough. Uh, I'm just going to continue to do my life and I'm going to make a nice career out of being a doctor in the U.S. She did not. She actually had a burden for the souls in Korea. She stayed. And she's buried next to her husband and her daughter in South Korea today. Why would somebody do that? Why would somebody leave a life of comfort and, and come to an uncomfortable place where the people around you look so different that they would actually call you monsters? That's how Korean people called the white folks that came as missionaries. You guys are ghosts. You guys are monsters. And many a times the Koreans, they were so against the message, they would throw stones at the houses of the missionaries and persecution was so high. And yet they stayed gave their life for the cause. Because I believe the missionaries, they heard from God these three words, I love you. I love you. And I love them. And they had a heart for the Korean people. Another lady, her name is Ruby Kendrick. And this lady came to Korea. She learned Korean for about uh, eight months. And then she contracted the virus. And she died. But on her tombstone are written these words. If I had a thousand lives to give, Korea should have them all. If I had a thousand lives to give, Korea should have them all. So because of the faithful martyrs and missionaries that came from all over the world, especially from America, now we have a faith that comes from generation to generation and we continue to share the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world. Now, my American Christian friends, do you see any disconnect from the faith of Rosetta and Ruby and with yours today? Do you see any disconnect with the faith that these people had in serving a people they didn't know, a people that smelled different, a people that ate different, a people that were really not very kind to them at all, but why would they give up their lives for strangers? And where are we today as American Christians? Oh, missions is just like a thing we do every year for a week or two. We throw some money at it and they're fine. That's missions, isn't it? That's a part of missions. Giving our lives to the cause. Isn't that the life our Lord Jesus lived? Jesus knew the love that God had for all humanity, his creation. John 3.16 is clear. For God so loved, not mediocre, not lukewarm love, so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. And whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And verse 17 goes on. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's the kind of love. Now, if we have received that kind of love, where the father is saying to us, I love you, son. I love you, daughter. Then our lives ought to be transformed. Now, we have missionaries even in our congregation, Martha and Larry Wilson. They served in Haiti as medical professionals. They, they served in South Korea uh, teaching. And, and we are blessed to have that heritage even in our own congregation. But where is the disconnect today? Well, I, I would observe the disconnect is this. Many of us have reverted from a God-based faith to a me-based faith. We're not moving this way to a God-based faith. We're actually downgrading and backsliding and becoming more comfortable and it, everything just a uh, road of less resistance. This is where we are. No? No? How can you be so sure? Oh, Pastor Elisha, if you say there's armed guards there and if I come into the sanctuary and worship, they're going to kill me. I'm going to come in anyway. I have that kind of faith. But because there's a virus, because I don't want to give my germs to anyone else or because I don't want to get contracted with the virus, what's so different? And I believe the state of where we are 
is a good reminder for us not to be a lukewarm church. Just bear with me for a moment. So you're scared of giving germs to other people and you're getting germs and, you, you know, you might get the virus and whatnot. And I, I hear you. And I wash my hands regularly too. And I use Purell too, right? I, I hear you. But has it ever occurred to you that there is a much worse virus in this world called a sin virus? In other words, a me virus. A sin virus that actually kills the soul and brings them down to hell for eternity. Separation from God. There is a sin virus that is much worse than the coronavirus or any other kind of virus that's going to come down the road. A much worse plague is the sin virus. And yet you and I don't have any passion to share Jesus with people in bringing people out from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, but we're scared about this virus. Now I understand that God gives each person a measure of faith. So I respect your faith. And I would ask you to respect mine, why my heritage comes from these martyrs called Rosetta Sherwood Hall and Ruby Kendrick. Ruby Kendrick only spent eight months in South Korea, but on her tombstone she writes, if I had a thousand lives to give, Korea should have them all. She knew what it means to share the gospel. And through her sacrifice, many other missionaries came to Korea. They built hospitals and, and schools, even my grandmother, to, to my mother's side, they, they went to a, a missions school. Those were the best schools back then. So we were able to get educated, and, and Christianity was able to be spread. And I have that kind of faith that I believe I'm going to give my life to the cause of the kingdom of God. Not just when there are armed guards there, but me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Me, for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. I respect your faith. I want you to respect mine. Why? Because it's your missionaries that kind of gave us that kind of faith. That it's, it's good. It's good to serve the Lord with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love him and love neighbor. That's the faith that has been given to us, inherited to us. So American Christians, are we sleeping today? Are your mind so focused on a, on a virus that you can't worship God? Lord, have mercy on us. Perhaps we've been so desensitized to the work of the Holy Spirit that he has been quenched and left in a corner. Maybe you treat Holy Spirit like Santa Claus. Let's say Santa Claus lived in your house. All right, Santa, we'll only activate you on Christmas Day. So for the rest of the 364 days of the year, you just stay in that corner and you stay put. We only use you on Christmas Day. Are we a me-based faith church or a God-based faith church? I'm asking myself that question. Some of you really want to tune out right now. Don't. Tune in. Lean in. The reason why Jesus would say you are a lukewarm church and say that you are, verse 17, wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked it's because Jesus loves the church. It's out of his love that he would say, this is what's going on. This is the exact diagnosis of your heart. You are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Oh God, how can you say that to me? I'm so offended. I thought I was rich, and I am rich, and I, I've made a lot of money. And I have this, and I have a position at church, and I'm the chief usher at church, and I do this, and I do this. For your glory, I do it. And when God exposes the true being of who we are, then we ought to be grateful and sing hallelujah. Rejoice 
because those are the words of love from Jesus. He doesn't want to spit you out of his mouth. He wants you to repent. He wants you to recognize where you are cannot be the place where you stay, a me-based faith. He wants you to move to a God-based faith. You become hot in the Lord, passionate, fervent for the Lord, or cold, refreshing, giving refreshing to God. Can you imagine? Let's say God gets thirsty. He, he doesn't. He's God Almighty. But let's just say that he gets thirsty. And you, with an act of love and grace and mercy, you serve God in such a way that you feel like you're giving God a, a cup of Coke with four ice cubes in it. And it's so nice and cool. Of course, I don't drink any diet stuff, by the way. But anyways, uh, and, and it's, it's so refreshing to God. You are a refreshing sacrifice to God. Imagine that. Wow, I want to be that kind of person. I yearn to be that kind of person that gives refreshing to God and I put a smile on my daddy's face. Not because I'm so good at doing stuff, but because I love him and I know he's saying to me, I love you. I love you. And it's because of that love I get to serve. I get to obey. Jesus wants the church in Laodicea to rise up again as a church fervent, as a church that is refreshing. And the only way we can advance in that way from a me-based to a God-based faith is through repentance is through fervent prayer, is through corporate worship, is through evangelism, is through all of these things, generosity. I want to thank everyone for, for blessing your church food pantry today with, with toilet rolls and food for those who came, picked up the communion cups and took the, took the palm leaves and, and you left donations. Thank you. Generosity is another mark of a God-based faith. I mean, in 20 years' time, are you going to say uh, you know, to people, you know, I still have, do you remember 2020 when the corona hit? You know, I was, I was one of those people that got all the toilet rolls from every single market basket and every Costco, and I, I'm still using it today. Oh, look at me, you know? Or are you going to be that person who continues to be generous and give it away to those who are in need. By the way, I'm so proud of our toilet paper ministry. Thank you, Alan, for leading that. Uh, Alan and Brenda, they wrapped up a toilet roll each, and they, we put our, our cards in there. And, and just saying, uh, we, we want to be a church that, that loves people. And would you like one? And some people were like, get away from me! You're trying to kill me! There's germs, germs, germs. And, and so Alan was gracious enough to step away and say, okay, God bless you, and he would leave. But there were 10 families on Dayton Street that actually received the gift. Received the gift. We need to move from a me-based faith to a God-based faith. How can I serve you, God? How can I honor you, God? How can I give to you my first fruits and not my leftovers, a better sacrifice, a better worship? Again, for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. I believe that with all my heart. Do you know there was a pastor that was arrested this past week for holding services at his church building? And people continue to say, Romans 13, Romans 13, you should obey, da, 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 da. Well, what I've learned as a Korean living in America, that you guys have a constitution. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech. Is that right, Alan? A constitution? God is doing some amazing things. Now, I find it so interesting that a local pastor had pressured the sheriff so much that this arrest happened. A local pastor in the same vicinity. We're living in those times. We are living in those times. Don't get so comfortable. 
We need to wake up as a church, by the way. We need God's awakening. And that's why we've been praying for revival. And God is giving it to us. And I'm praying for uh, that church and that pastor. And I'm praying for those who are attacking that church like crazy. Now there's two camps in the Christian world right now. Fighting. And I would say to you, don't get involved. Pray for both parties. I wish both parties could respect one another. And pray together for unity. Jesus gives us an antidote to the lukewarm church. And let's, let's dive in real quick. Verse 18. Jesus is counseling. Let me, let me read for you verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Jesus is, is actually going at those points where he said you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. He is going at those points. First, he says, buy from me gold refined in the fire. We all know that Jesus Christ is, is the the ultimate refined by fire gold type. Now, pure. There is no one more pure than Jesus. Amen? Jesus is saying to the church in Laodicea, buy from me. And I, I, I read in Job 22, then the Almighty will be your gold, the choicest silver for you. Isaiah 55 says, come. All you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Now, you can't buy something if you don't have money. But what God is asking is saying, asking us to do is have faith. Have faith. If Jesus commands you to buy from me gold refined by fire, then by faith you do it. By faith you move forward and you declare it and you proclaim it. Jesus, I need you. I need you in my life. I honor you. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor and what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. Gold symbolizes Christ himself. What about the white clothes and the salve for your eyes? Of course, Jesus is our white garment. We are robed with his righteousness. Amen? And I serve. It's cream to, to help you see better. Jesus, without Jesus, we cannot see. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. And the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by what? Faith. I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. Jesus is our I serve. He helps us to see clearly. If your mind is cloudy, let Jesus put some eye salve on you today. If you feel like you are in the wind and you're all naked and bare, let Jesus be your robe of righteousness by faith today. Jesus, our pure gold. Jesus, our garment of righteousness. Jesus, our eye salve to to open up our eyes. We sing this, don't we? Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Are we seeing God's glory today? So many of us need to turn off the radio, <laughs> if you have radios. Turn off the TV. Turn off your news feed. Get off social media. Do a fast. This is Holy Week, by the way. How about we fast from that? Is it so important that you need to know the statistics of every person from the CDC and the WHO? It's important for us to gaze our focus on Jesus. Now is the best time for all of us to search our hearts in Jesus' words. We need wisdom in this age. People with information will tell you anything and everything. Don't believe everything you see on YouTube. Guard your hearts and test it with the word of God. By the way, if you haven't opened your Bibles throughout this pandemic, I urge you to do so. 
I urge you to open your Bibles. Read it. And let his word read you. Verse 19, let's go on. Those whom I love, this is Jesus speaking. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Jesus is saying, I love you to his church, then and now with rebuke and discipline. But I'm afraid so many of us have become so soft that we get offended when Jesus rebukes us. And we don't want his discipline. We're like entitled kids. And you want a ribbon for everything you do, even if it's wrong. Is that right? Would a parent give a ribbon if they do something really, really wrong? Or would you tell them, that's not, that's not good, son. That's not good, daughter. Jesus is saying, I love you through rebuke and discipline and correction. That's a glorious thing. If you're a mature child of the king, you would say, thank you, Jesus, for rebuking me. Because if I had continued down that path, I know I would have continued to sin against you. It's not, it's not like this. God's trying to punish you. God's trying to be like, ah, see, I got you. Ah, I saw you sleeping there. I saw you uh, dozing off. Ah, 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 ah. That's not God. That's not God. God's a loving father who comes and says, son, are you tired? Let's go get a fresh cup of water. Are you hungry? Let's go get a nice bowl of soup, the Haitian style, you know, a nice bowl of soup like that. And he wants to encourage you forward. He wants to pick you up. The devil will condemn you and pull you down to hell while God will convict you and pull you towards heaven. Be reminded of that. Again, many of you are thinking, oh, Pastor Elijah, you're being so condemning today. Why are, you, why are you so passionate? I'm passionate because I have learned the faith through the martyrs who came to my land and died for the sake of the gospel. And their blood still speaks today in my own soul. By the way, they were your people too. So what's happened in the three, four generations what has weakened the American church so much that we have been silenced? Church, have we become lukewarm? We need to grow up just a little bit. We need to grow up just a little bit. Do you hear him knocking? Do you hear Jesus knocking? He is outside of his church that is lukewarm. And many scholars would agree with me that the door that Jesus is knocking at has no handle on the outside but can only be opened from the inside. Church, are you ready to open up the doors for the king? Let him cleanse you, fill you, love you towards a God-based faith that is full of passion, full of vigor. Not like, oh, pastor's preaching about repentance again. Oh, there he goes. He's that holiness preacher. That's what he does all the time. Not from our congregation, by the way. Jesus, in verse 21, continues to express his love. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He wants his church to overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the testimony of the saints. That's what Jesus wants. He's saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Continue to overcome, 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 overcome fear, overcome anxiety, overcome all of these things so that you may be able to sit with me on my throne. Wow, that's God's love for us. Do you know why Jesus' name is above every name? It's because he said, not my will, but yours be done. And he followed through to the T 
of what God wanted for him to accomplish on this earth. I wonder if we as a church family can overcome together by faith so that Jesus' name is continually glorified among us. In Revelation 7, verse 9 and 10, reads this, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every tribe, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation! belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Isn't that a glorious picture of heaven? Now why do I bring up this text on Palm Sunday? Because many people on that day, they threw down their cloaks as Jesus rode on a donkey into Jerusalem. And they waved the palm leaves they said, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. They were so expectant of their Messiah King, a political, a military leader, they thought. But only a couple of days later, they probably threw down their palm branches and began to point their finger at Jesus. And they would cry out, Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Some of you are thinking, were the Jewish people bipolar? Were they mad? Were they just having a bad day? No. No to all of those. What they did is a reflection of who we are today. At one point, you say, oh Lord, glory, glory, hallelujah, thank you for saving my soul. And, and at some point, when things don't go your way, instead of Yahweh, when things don't go your way, you throw down the palm and you point your finger at God. And you say, how dare you foil my plan? And that comes from a me-based faith. And again, God is wanting us to move from a me-based faith to a God-based faith. Your will be done. I see Jesus continuing to say to us, I love you. He, he says, I love you uh, in, in his action of coming into Jerusalem uh, with his heart. He's saying, Jesus' heart is saying, I'm in full alignment with the Father's will, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Although the pain and suffering, uh, Father, if you can take away this cup, you can, but not my will, but yours be done. He's saying, I love you with his heart. Jesus is saying, I love you with his humility. A king does not ride on a donkey. A king rides on a white stallion. The president of a nation does not ride on a buggy that is rusty, but rather he rides on the most luxurious car, the safest car possible. But in Jesus' humility, he shows his love and says, I love you. Jesus says, I love you, with his perseverance and patience, something that we all need today. Amen? Amen? Jesus fully knows that these people who are cheering him have an agenda, and the same people will be the ones saying, crucify him. And yet, he does not impose his will upon them, but patiently, patiently perseveres. Jesus says, I love you with his foresight of the prize that would be won through his sacrifice. You and me, all of humanity, 
would find a way for salvation through Jesus, through his death and through his resurrection. Jesus continues to say, I love you. I believe God is saying, I love you to all of us today through the text and even through this whole series of the seven churches of Revelation. Even on this Palm Sunday, Jesus is saying to us, I love you. That's why I don't want you to stay in this rut anymore. A me-based faith will never satisfy and quench your thirst for wholeness. You'll always be found lacking. And so buy from me fine gold. Buy from me good food. So we move together to a God-based faith. Not my will, but yours be done. Some of you are really getting upset. You keep talking about God's will, God's will, God's will. I'm doing God's will. I'm doing what's natural to me. False! What's natural to you is of the flesh. We need to become people that are naturally supernatural. We don't do the things that's easy and comfortable and always find something that's more luxurious because I'm better than you. It's nothing about that. Jesus came to this earth not to be served, but to serve. That's whom we follow. Jesus is our master. Jesus died for us. So what are we going to do for him? Again, my faith is based on the martyrs. The ultimate martyr, Jesus Christ. Friends, we really need to think about what Jesus is saying to us today. He's saying, I love you. I love you so much, I don't want you to stay here any longer. You gotta move. You gotta move. You gotta move to a God-based faith. This is where I want you to be. This is where you'll find purpose and destiny and wholeness. This is the place to be. How can you do that? Get filled with the Holy Ghost. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. Receive the anointing from God. Yearn and cry out in repentance for all the sins that you've committed. It's okay. Today is not too late. Tomorrow is not promised. But today you can repent. And that's my hope for us. That God would hold back his cup of wrath so we can continue to share the good news with as many people and continue to say Jesus' words, I love you, to as many people as we meet. Friends, Jesus is saying to you, I love you. How will you respond? Oh, love you back, Jesus. I'm just going to go back to my daily life. Do you know why the world wants this pandemic to end so quickly? Let me give you some foresight. This is free, by the way. They want to go back to their way of sinning. They miss their sinful way of life. It was so convenient. Do you know the brothels are closed? The strip bars are closed? The bars are closed? They want to get back to normal, the sinful way of life. For us Christians, we need to get back to being naturally supernatural. Let us pray. Father God, you have taught us through your word throughout Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3 that you love your bride, you love your church. And we believe that God's word is a love letter to us. If the word of God could be squeezed, what would drip would be your love for all humanity and for us. Help us to heed your loving words of rebuke today your loving words of discipline because you're rebuking us towards holiness. You are disciplining us towards wholeness in Christ. Lord, pick us up from a me-based faith to a God-based faith where our value systems are so focused on glorifying and honoring and praising you. Father, some of us need to do some spring cleaning in our hearts today. Help us. Help us to submit to your will. To repent. Not just say sorry and go back to the dog's vomit again. To a sinful lifestyle. I'm praying against all strongholds to be broken down in Jesus' name right now. 
I'm praying that you would deliver us from being duped by the enemy, by all the deceptive lies that come from hell, to be exposed and to be expelled in the name of Jesus right now. And I'm praying that you would set the captives free today, even if there's one watching on the live stream that needs to hear Jesus loves them and that they can trust Jesus for their forgiveness and eternity by putting their faith in them. Lord, may it be done in their hearts, O Lord. May we all heed the knocking of Jesus in our hearts and accept him and receive him as Lord and Savior and Master. May we no longer put him off. And I pray for comfort for your people today, for this congregation. Many of us are living in fear, although they would never say that out loud. Root out where that is coming from, O Lord. A false security, burn it down in the name of Jesus. A false stability, burn it down in the name of Jesus. We are just passing through. We are pilgrims. Our eyes are focused on heaven. And Father, we have faith to live heaven on this earth right now. So grant us your faith. Grant us hope. Grant us your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.